Welcome back to Be My Guest. As I said before the break, joining me on the line right now is Tim Tietrich from New Jersey. And before we get to Tim, I just want to roll a little bit of a video that was done a few years ago uh, about him, and it's called Tim Tietrich, The Bionic Man. It tells you everything you need to know, a very quick snapshot of this man and what he's done in harness racing. Um, we'll go to it right now, just so a little bit of the, of the, the video, and then we'll, we'll uh, talk to Tim. Now, football has Broadway Joe, the refrigerator, and the Minister of Defense. But harness racing has the bionic man. Tim Tietrich, harness driver. Gentlemen, we can rebuild him. We have the technology. We have the capability to make the world's first bionic man. Tim Tietrich will be that man. Better than he was before. Better. Stronger. Faster. And it's Shark Gesture home free! Shark Gesture! The night belongs to Tim Tietrich, the bionic man! Tim Tietrich began his career in 1998 at the age of 16 when he started driving his father's horses on the Illinois County Fair Circuit. In the past decade, he's evolved into a superhuman in the sulky. In both 2004 and 2005, he captured driving titles on the Chicago circuit and finished among the leading dash drivers in North America. Then came his big move to the East. He relocated to Dover Downs and the rest is, well, history. In 2007, Tietrich stunned the sport as he set new single season records for both victories and purses earned. That season, he visited the winner's circle almost 1,200 times and earned purses of over 18 million. The 28-year-old was named Driver of the Year by both Harness Tracks of America and the United States Harness Raiders Association in 2007 and 2008. Wow, this has got to be like a dream for you. Oh, it definitely is. You know, it's uh, exposed to bigger rate. That just gives you a quick snapshot of Tim Tietrich and what he's done since he burst onto the national scene in 2007. As I said before, uh, on last Saturday was the Breeders' Crown at Woodbine. Breeders' Crown is like the championship event for uh, harness racing for all the horses, age, gait, sex. And uh, there was 12 races. Tim Tietrich won four to set uh, a record that night. Tim, how are you doing this morning? I'm very good, thanks, guys. <clears throat> good. Um, Tim, first I want to say to you... Uh, Looking back on what happened Saturday night, you won those four races. It just seemed like you had magic. Um, you probably had great nights, great memories of, of, your, of your career. And granted, it's, your career is still in the infancy stage. Who knows where it's going to go, what you're going to do, what type of records you're going to set. But what are your recollections of uh, or your memories of, the, of last Saturday night? Well, it, <clears throat> excuse me, but it was a very, uh, very awesome night. Uh, I, I Going into the night, I thought I could have a really good shot at winning you know, five or six of them. And... Before I got there, and, you know, it could have been a real, really magical night if two of my dead favorites, Captain Treacherous and Check Me Out, would have responded as well as I thought they would and would have could have won there. So you guys wouldn't have been saying four. You guys maybe would have been saying six. Yeah, when something like that happens, you know, you're, you're, you're on a roll. You're winning these races. And I'm going to point to one race in a couple of minutes, you know, the um, the Chapter 7 race. But when, you on a, when you're on a roll like that and then you come back and you're, you get on a horse – you're supposed to win, you know, like a captain treacherous at one to five, and you lose. Does it kind of just kind of bring you back to reality that every race is different, and you know you can be on the best horse, and sometimes you won't win? Absolutely, uh, you know. But uh, like some of my uh, mentors told me, said after a race you got to turn the page, move on to your next client, you know, and you got to forget about it, and you know, go into that next race with a clear head and no dwell on the past. When you when you again when you when you you come up short on, on, a, on a race in which you're on the heavy favorite and you're walking back, people are saying stuff to you. Are you kind of, have you blocked it out of your mind or, or do you actually hear what people are saying? And conversely, you know, when you score a huge win, you know, do you hear what they're saying? Yeah, you, you, you know, you listen and you pay attention. And, you know, I, I try not to miss anything, you know, but uh, there's always people out there that uh, naysayers and you did wrong or that was not the right move or, you know, hearsay. So, just got to take it with a grain of salt and, 
in the next nine moves you make, they might be talking good about you. So. Yeah, there was, uh, you know, last year there was an incident in which you and, and several other drivers and some trainers didn't make it down to the racetrack and you missed the Breeders' Crown. When something like that happens, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a rarity, but, you know, do you, do you sort of plan differently, like, say, for this year getting down there, or is it just, you know, it was one of those things and you, you just chalk it up to it happens? You know, I think the last two years I've made 37 or 38 trips up there, and we've had one snowstorm, and it was last year for the Breeders' Crown. And the last time they had a snowstorm in uh, New Jersey was the Civil War. <laughs> That month of October, so it's been a long time since they've had any snow. It's just a freak deal, and you know, for some reason, God didn't want us to get there, and that's all we can do about it. You know, it's, we tried to get there. We sat at the airport for eight hours and nine hours trying to get a plane to get us to get us there, and we couldn't get nothing. You know, with the snow and all you know, the planes were taken, and we couldn't get nothing going. Just one of those things, yeah. So this year, basically, you know, I'm looking at like. You had a great night. Yannick Jingra had a great night. Dave Miller had a decent night. So almost three of the four guys who didn't make it last year ended up having a really good year this year, a really good night this year, almost to make up for what happened last year. Yeah, you know, it, it's a bittersweet. You know, I, I could have added three more trophies to my my uh, score last year. I thought last year I had some really good horses. And, uh, you know, it's a shame that we didn't make it. You know, it's definitely because we, we wanted to be there. You know, we were sick about it. and. You know, I had a lot of people call me that night to make sure I hadn't jumped off the GW Bridge. <laughs> how, you know, how bad I wanted to be there. So, you know, it's, uh, <clears throat> no, nobody wants to miss those kind of races, no matter what. You know, it's just, that's what we work all year for, for the era in honors and trying to drive the horses. There was one race the other, the other night, the Chapter 7 race, and I thought, you know what? Things like this happen. You, you get on the horse, and you're parked outside. You're, you're right beside Commander Crow, uh, a horse who last year basically got parked down for much of the race and, and, and didn't win. You were in a similar situation this year. You had a choice uh, when you're up the back stretch there. You could have tried to just, you know, get by him, just, you know, see if you can seize the lead early and, 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 and hope that he had something left for the end, or you basically just sit beside him, wait, wait, and wait, and then make the move. Obviously, you had to know you had a lot of horse underneath you and, and, and had the confidence that, that he could withstand that type of situation being parked for, for a good part of the race. But I, I, I never thought I wasn't going to let him go. You know, So the only shot I had was to try to set out there because he put his whip up every time I'd come at him. So you know, I just tried to make him keep an honest pace where he couldn't just totally slit and race on me. And you know, I made my horse look his horse right in the eye. And you know, the, the little guy uh, wore down the big giant, I guess you could say. But... Um, you've got to give my little horse a lot of credit, and he sat on the outside and just buried that horse. So, does, does something like that come with experience? Like, think of yourself, you know, earlier in your career um, when you may have not had that type of feel, that type of experience. Would you have tried possibly to just go by the other horse? Um, or, and it, was this an example of you know the number of years you've been driving situations like that, the feel for the horse, all those things combined? You know, you were in a better situation than maybe it would have been, say, five, six, seven, ten years ago. Uh, I guess more maturity. You know, probably I'd have been so mad before that he parked the, you know, my horse that I just took, made sure he didn't win. You know, I'd have worn right down. And either you parked me or we're both going to finish last. But, you know, I've had in the past, you know, I've, patience is a virtue in this game. And sometimes you got to wait. And, you know, sometimes I'm a big power driver. And most of the time I'm kind of trying to finesse them. And, but, uh. You know, that's, I just sat there. I just knew I was screwed, you know, and I just sat there and, you know, made my horse think that he was following somebody and, you know, it worked out. You know, every race is different, you know, depending on where, you, where your post is, you know, how, uh, how, you know, things happen off the gate. You know, some guys like to get to the lead really early and, you know, and, and, and set the, you know, the pace right from there. Other guys are content to just sit behind and, and wait, wait, and wait. You know, what type of driver are you? Is it is it dependent upon the race, or are you, again, one of those guys who likes to get to the front early and let everybody, you know, play catch you? Uh, catch you? I'm a driver, whatever that horse needs. That's the way I look at myself. I can drive on the front or off the pace first up. I, I try to drive my horse first and race second, you know, and make sure that uh, I get my horse's best opportunity without hurting him and try to find out which way he likes to race the best. Some horses like it first up, some don't like moving off the rail, and... You know, some horses, uh, you know, like a trip. So some of them like it rough where you just got to race them right down the highway. You know, like Andrew Vett, she, she likes it that way where you can, uh, you know, be very aggressive with her. She likes it. 
you know, check me out. It's more of a finesse filly. You get her back and, you know, move your make, make your moves very well. She's very fast, but, you know, she can't really go four quarters all by herself. She likes you to uh, finesse her a little bit. And we're just looking at right, a race now, like, like a half-mile track or five-eighths mile track versus like a seven-eighths mile track or a mile track. You know, it used to be you had to always, you know, race on these, uh, you know, on these very small tracks, and it was a lot of turns, and it took a lot of time and patience. When you see these tracks now that are like mile tracks or seven eighths mile track, does it does it change the way that you drive, or is it again every track, every race is just basically different? So many things can happen. Well, you know, every track's different, but even even at these big tracks, the Meadowlands and Woodbine and. You know, most of them are speed-favoring racetracks. You know, our horses have gotten better, the equipment's gotten better, and, you know, you can go three quarters in 21 and, you know, still get home in 27 seconds. And when you're when you're setting four or five lengths off the turn for home, it's hard for horses to face home in 25 and four or 26 seconds flat to, you know, catch those horses when they're coming home in 27 in the front. So anymore, all these tracks, you have to be pretty forwardly placed or you're just not going to get there. You know, they've changed a lot of the rules about, you know, using the whip and the stretch. As, as a veteran driver, um, has it changed the way that you, you, you drive? And, you know, because basically they've almost changed the rules on the fly. They didn't do it right now, but when they made those changes, did it? Are you consciously thinking, like, how you're, how you're whipping the horse in the stretch, or is it just you just learn? Well, you, well, yeah, you don't want to, like, for the first 10 years of my life, I was allowed to one hand my horse to encourage him to go forward. Now I can't, so you're always thinking, man, don't hit this thing or you'll get placed last and you get fined a lot of money. You know, you got to, you know, down here in the States, we can still use our whips, you know, sparingly, but we can still use them. In Canada, you can't. You know, so, you know, when you're flying back and forth and driving each track, you got to make sure that you keep telling yourself, don't hit them up there, you know? Mm-hmm. You know, one thing that's interesting about you is is, is your sulky and the wheels, and they're, they're colorful wheels, and I think it's kind of like a... You know, it's it's something different. You see, some other drivers are using it. Why did you decide to adopt? You know, a, a sulky that had like you know the the yellow wheels. Was it just to for people to to identify who you is, or just to add some color to the game? Well, I was a big John Deere fan. You know, it's John Deere green and yellow. You know, I just uh, my colors are green and yellow. My dad always had green and yellow, and I'm you know, a big John Deere fan. And, um, and I just like those two colors together. I think they look really good. You know. Kelly Green and Brett Gold, I think they look really good. How did your father, like I know up here in Canada, there was a, uh, a, a trainer uh, by the name of John Burns. He had those colors. Steve Condren was, uh, you know, kind of a, uh, I wouldn't say he's a student of John Burns, but one of John Burns' disciples. How did your father come to, to choose those colors? Uh, I think him and his father, you know, just come up with them, but I don't think there was a real big reason. I think my dad just played green and yellow. <laughs> You know, so I think that's what they kind of went with. <clears throat> you know, Tim, it's, it's, you've been driving for not, not that long a period of time, yet you've done some pretty amazing things. What things do you want to do in the future in terms of, you know, whether it's records, accomplishments? Do you set goals for yourself every year? Well, I, I surpassed my goals my first year of ever catch driving horses. I didn't think I'd ever, you know, get to win a thousand races or, you know, blah, blah, blah. I always wanted to do that. And it, how do you set goals? How do you, uh, you know, I just want to keep doing better. I want to uh, win another Hambo. You know, I want to, you know, win a jug. And I, I want to be the leading money winner driver in the sport because when you are, that means you're doing good and, you know, people really want you because, you know, to make the big money, you got to be in the big races and have shots at those million-dollar races. <laughs> this is the last question I will ask you is where do you think harness racing is going because it's it's gone through so many different transitions. You know, the metal lines, it looks like it's, it's getting healthy again. Um... Are you confident about the future of, of, of harness racing? Well, I think they're always going to be a sport. You know, it's uh, right now I think it's as good as it's ever been, especially for me. You know, the money's good. But, uh, you know, we have a lot of ifs, you know, with Canada and New Jersey. And, you know, Pennsylvania is very, very strong. And But uh, I think the racing is very, you know, strong. I think there's a lot of good horses, a lot of good drivers, and it's very specialized. You know, so, you know, it gives the gambler uh, – you know, a true shot at making their money when they do gambling. You know, you got to be smart enough to follow it and, you know, keep up to it. But it's it's game on every race. People are always trying to get to the winner's circle. Tim, thanks for joining us this morning. As I said, I was, you know, watching the other night. Uh, I always liked the Breeders' Crown. Uh, you know, great night of racing. You had a great night. Uh, thanks for joining us and keep up the good work. Absolutely. Glad to be on the show. And uh, anytime I can help, I'm here. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.
Tim Tietrich, harness racing superstar driver. I should have said that because this this guy just he's got the hands, you know. He's like you know those hockey players that got the hands. He's got the hands.